So today we're going to talk about gas distribution, which is a fundamental within the gas industry, and it's basically where does gas come from? So what we're going to be covering is what is natural gas? The raw materials, where does gas come from? The European gas pipeline, natural gas transmission pipelines, the Bacton gas terminal, the Milford Haven uh, liquid natural gas terminal, the national grid, gas distribution network, gas distribution, and then mains to appliances. So how does the gas get from the pipeline into the boilers, the fires, the cookers, and things like that? So what is natural gas? It's a natural occurring substance. Its chemical symbol is um, CH4, one carbon, four hydrogens. It's a natural occurring phenomenon. We tap into it and then we put it through burners, through a distribution network, and it ends up coming through your gas cooker, your gas fire, your gas boiler. So that's what we're going to look at. As coming into the gas industry, obviously we need to understand what natural gas is. So where did it come from? Millions of years ago, tiny sea plants and animals died. They were buried on the ocean floor. Over time, they got covered in layers of silt and sand and sediment. And over the years, the sediment got deeper and deeper. And then with lots of enormous amounts of heat and pressure, they turned them into oil and gas. And that's what we're looking for now. That's what the people go prospecting for. They've been doing it for a great number of years. So today we drill down through layers of sand and silt and rock to reach the rock formations that contain the oil and the gas deposits. And then we extract them. The oil goes to form things like petroleum and coal tar and the gas, we use that after it's been refined as natural gas as we know it for our cookers, our boilers and our appliances. So the raw natural gas is composed of several gases. It doesn't just come straight out the ground as natural gas as we know it. The main constituent of natural gas is methane. That's where the chemical symbol CH4 comes from. If you did chemistry at school, you might remember that. Other components include other gases, ethane, propane, butane. If you do any camping or caravanning, you might know about propane and butane. That's the gas that you get in the bottles, the blue bottles, generally for butane, the orange bottles there for propane, and we connect them up to our gas barbecues and things like that. Also in the raw natural gas, you've got water vapour. Because it's down under the ocean, it's moist. You've also got hydrogen sulphide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, which is the most abundant gas around us. 80% of atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. And then you've got helium, the stuff that you put into the balloons when it's somebody's birthday. It's lighter than air and it rises up. During the process of extracting this natural gas and refining it for us to use, they take a lot of these components out. So they're gonna remove them out of the, out the raw natural gas. Things like ethane, propane and butane, hydrogen sulphide and helium, some of them are removed and can be sold separately. Obviously I've just mentioned about the propane and the butane. They're taken off and they're sold as a separate entity. So methane, let's have a look at this in more detail. It's a non-toxic gas and it's the main ingredient in natural gas. It's around 90% of raw natural gas is methane. That's why in the gas industry, we, talk, we tend to class methane as natural gas. So when we say natural gas, we're actually talking about methane. Even though, as we've just mentioned, raw natural gas has got all these other components in. I mentioned earlier, it's chemical symbol CH4, and it's the simplest form of hydrocarbon molecule. It's odorless. That's why there's a chemical called tetrahydrophene added. That's why if you turn your gas on at home and you smell it, that's why there's an odour with it. It's that tetrahydrophene that's been added to give it that distinct smell, just as a warning in case there's a gas leak. Um, methane emissions released into the atmosphere, they become greenhouse gases. So that's one of the greenhouse gases. One of the other components is ethane. That's C2H4, so it's got two carbons, uh, sorry, C2H6, two carbons, six hydrogens. And it's the only two carbon alkaline. It's typically made up of 5.3% of natural gas. That's made up of ethane. So it's the second largest fossil fuel component. Ethane's primary use is in the petrochemical feed stock 
um, for ethane production. It's also a greenhouse gas, but it's a lot smaller scale than methane. Then we've got propane, C3H4, so three carbons, uh, sorry, C3H8, three carbons, eight hydrogens. It's a three carbon alkaline. And it's only 1% of natural gas, so it's quite a small amount, but it's removed and then it can be sold. We use it for grills, portable stoves. You can also use it for transport, so gas-powered buses and taxis, forklift trucks, um, recreational vehicles. Propane combustion is not as clean as natural gas, but it's much cleaner than burning petrol. Then we've got butane, the last one of these gases. Again, it's odourless. It does have a faint smell, a um, little bit natural gas or petrol. It's highly flammable and it's easily turned into a liquid. So in the bottle gases, they're liquids, which when released into atmosphere, turn into a gas. Its chemical formula is C4H10, so we've got four carbons and 10 hydrogens. It's only about 0.4% of the natural gas mixture. It's better known for your cigarette lighters, or blow torches, portable stoves, aerosol propellant, and a refrigerant. It's now been phased out because it's a greenhouse gas, so there are more environmentally friendly um, refrigerants being used. Other components such as the water vapour, the carbon dioxide are only about 0.6%. Nitrogen 2.7%. They may be removed to improve the quality of the natural gas. So we've got the calorific value of natural gas which we'll talk about in, in a later um, presentation. And it's easier to move the gases if we get rid of all these water vapours and things. It transports a lot easier which is what we need to do to get it into your houses. So the resulting process of natural gas, it contains mostly methane and ethane. Having said that, there's no such thing as typical natural gas. We're in the UK. There's gas fields all around the UK. We do get some of our gas, but we import gas, as we'll see a little bit later on when we look at the European pipeline and things like liquefied natural gas. We're importing gas into the UK and into Europe from all over the, all over the world. It comes in tankers as liquefied and it comes through distribution pipeworks from as far as Africa and, and Europe. It's typically found underground in rock formations. They're in reservoirs which contain small cavities and they trap, retain water, natural gas and oil. And sometimes part of the oil extraction, the natural gas is burnt off. Sometimes you'll see on television, it's showing uh, um, a platform extracting oil and they've got a burn stack, so there's a big flame on the top of it, and that's the natural gas being burnt off because there's so little of it, it's not cost effective to harvest it. But then there are natural gas reserves where there are no oil at all. So basically, they're just taking that natural gas, and then we're putting it in pipelines, putting it on shore, and then we refine it. So there's different extraction techniques. There's the drilling. More recently, they've looked at fracking. Fracking is where they basically go into where there's cracked rocks, they inject water in, that water expands the cracks and then they can drain the gas off along with the water and refine that. Um, once it's been extracted, the natural gas is transported through pipelines to processing plants. That's where they take the other hydrocarbons out, the liquid out of it and things like that. The purified gas is either sent back through pipelines to distribution centres or obviously in summer when we're not using as much gas because we're not putting our heating on, it can be stored. So it's either stored as a liquefied gas by compressing it so you can get more of the gas in a smaller area or it's stored in uh, caverns. So this is just a diagram which shows there. So basically we've got a conventional non-associated gas um, and then we've got methane coal beds, we've got the land surface We've got the grey area which is the seal, which is like, it's typically, it's like a clay, so it can't get out, the gas doesn't escape. And then we've got the gas rich shale which we're extracting the gas from. This is just another diagram showing the gas being extracted, going through a processing plant. Some of that is converted, some of the gas is used in power stations, gas fuel power stations, and then some of it goes through to be refined and it's going into the UK gas grid. 
So the European pipeline, as we can see, we're in the UK and we've got pipelines coming over from Russia, from Norway, Azerbaijan, North Africa. And then as I mentioned earlier, we've got the liquefied natural gas terminals. So we've got a couple of, of those in the UK and they're all around Europe. They're usually and typically getting the liquefied natural gas is coming from further afield, South America. Venezuela is a big exporter of liquefied natural gas. They extract it as gas and then they compress it, turn it into a liquid, put it in tankers, um, which are typically a quarter of a mile long, these gas tankers, massive amounts of natural gas that come over to Europe to feed our need for natural gas within our, our environment. If we look at the UK distribution side, we can see there we've got Milford Haven, um, which is a liquid natural gas terminal, more of that later. And then we've got Grain, which is down towards the Isle of Dogs. Again, that's a nat uh, liquefied natural gas terminal. And we've got the Bacton uh, terminal, which is where a lot of the European pipelines come into. That comes into the Bacton um, side of it. So there we've got the Bacton gas terminal quite a big site so that's where gas comes in from the UK from Europe that's where it's processed it's refined and then we sent out through the UK distribution site into our own homes that's the Milford Haven liquid natural gas terminal so again they're taking the liquid natural gas some of it is stored as liquid some of it is stored as gas and then again that's put into the UK network and it's sent out through the uh, the mains into our properties so the national grid, national grid transmission system, it consists of different pressures. We've got high pressure transmissions. That's under real high pressures. They can be up to 70 bar pressure, very, very high pressures. And that's owned and operated by the national grid PLC. Then we've got the national transmission system and gas distribution network. They form the pipe network, which carries gas from the shore terminals around the coast to individual properties. And then we've got different pressures. As I mentioned, we've got the 70 bar in the national grid coming right down to the district main and through your gas meter, which comes in at around about 21 millibar. We'll see a bit more of that as we, as we go through the presentation. So in the UK, we've got a number of companies that look after the pipelines and things like that. Up in Scotland and down in the south, uh, the south East, we've got Scotia Gas Network, so they look after all the pipe work and things up there. Um, in the north, we've got Northern Gas Network, round about the Midlands, over into Manchester and Lancashire. Um, going down into East Anglia, we've got Cadence, and then over in Wales, going down into uh, Cornwall, Devon, round that area, we've got Wales and North West. So they're the ones that are looking after the pipe work in that area. So in, in where we are in Halifax at Viva, if we had a problem and we needed to contact our emergency service provider, we'd ring up and we'd probably get hold of uh, Caden. That's the people that cover around our area. So the gas distribution network, we've come through the terminals and then we're going to compressor stations. That's what compresses that gas up to this 70 bar, which is then going into either storage or going through and then we've got governor stations what a governor station does it drops that pressure from high pressure down to medium pressure and then there are smaller governor stations which drop it down to district pressure and we'll see that as we're going through so we've got low pressure mains and medium pressure mains so the high pressure main will go through a governor station into a medium pressure and it drops from 70 bar down to somewhere between 2 bar and 75 millibar then it'll go into low pressure mains, which are up to 75 millibar. Then it comes through a service connection on the main, onto a service pipe, going through the emergency control valve, the ECV, into a meter regulator. That meter regulator is designed to maintain in our properties 21 millibar plus or minus two millibar. So it doesn't matter if you've just got your gas cooker turned on, or your gas fire in your gas cooker, your gas fire, your gas cooker in your boiler, that's designed to maintain that pressure at that 21 millibar plus or minus two millibar. It's so that obviously in the middle of the night, there's very few people up. And if we didn't have a regulator and you put your gas cooker on, the flame could be four or five feet high. You don't want that. You want it maintained at the correct height. So that's the idea of the meter regulator. And then each appliance has got an isolation valve and pressures can be checked at those. 
and the gas regulation said we shouldn't lose more than one millibar pressure between our appliance and our meter. Again, we'll pick all this up in a later presentation when we start looking at gas pressures and meter regulators and things like that. So that was uh, the gas distribution network and from coming out the ocean to coming out the gas appliances. So now you should have a better understanding of where gas comes from, a little bit about what gas is. So until the next time, um, thanks very much for watching and hopefully you'll understand what we're doing and I'll see you on the next presentation.